you that are in the habit of filling in the blanks on the outline, we'll just get right into it with the first one this morning. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? (laughs) Faced a daunting task? Uh, I'm going to suggest that we all have. And and preacher Mark Adams introduced a sermon. He asked this very question. He made his way through about four different examples. And and with each one, I could see somebody else very clearly, somebody that I know or family, somebody that may be exactly in this place at this point this week. He He said, maybe you remember experiencing this feeling as a parent, you know, the, the first time you brought your baby home from the hospital. You instantly love that that's not baby Elena, that's just a stock photo, but that's... You instantly love this little guy or gal with every molecule of your being. But as you consider the challenge of feeding, clothing, parenting that child for the next 21 years, and I thought thought I was 18, but now it's 21 and (laughs) more. uh, He says, well, let's just say the staggering responsibility made you feel completely inadequate. You could not conceive of how you were going to find the parental wisdom and the patience and the energy and the money to get this all-important job done. And trying to take care of a newborn's needs on an average of four hours of sleep a night magnifies the feeling. Overwhelmed. I don't know if you've ever sent a text to your significant other recently. I'm done. He said maybe there have been times when your job has made you feel overwhelmed. The constant hours, uh, the work, the business trips, the ever-increasing demands makes you feel like you're a drowning man going down for the third time. Maybe you feel overwhelmed by your finances. No matter how carefully you budget, the bills always threaten to overwhelm your income. And it seems only a matter of time before you will begin to lose ground. Denise and I just put about a thousand dollars into the Santa Fe two weeks ago, the brakes and the tires and some of that normal stuff. Two weeks ago, last week, eleven hundred in the truck. Same, and it's like you know, it's like they sit in the garage together, and he feels left out. You know, me too, me too. So <laughs> it's like, oh. You know, if you're a teenager, he wrote. He said, "You may have felt overwhelmed recently as you face final exams. Timely, this pile of." Huge make or break tests, feeling like a tidal wave that's coming toward you. You don't know how you're possibly going to cram enough information into your brain and keep it there long enough to get the grade you need. And Mark Adams in his sermon went on to say, if you can relate, then pay close attention to this message because we began a study of a book of the Bible and and we're the same. We're looking at this man in the Bible by name of Joshua and we can learn from his example we're going to read the text. We want to turn in, in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the law, and then Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, it's page 178 if you use the black pew Bibles there in front of you. And we're going to read the first nine verses, Verses the Lord speaking to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For where the Lord your God will be, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I think it's fair to say that as we consider the next blanks here, Joshua can relate. Where Joshua has legitimate 
um, significant reasons to feel overwhelmed. And a man named uh, Michael Rochelle did a good job of listing some of these reasons. And the people, if you have the chapter open, the people themselves will have to reiterate what God just told Joshua. At the very end of chapter 1, it's almost like the people can see Joshua up there and his knees are knocking. And they have to repeat what God just said. We'll be with you. Only be strong and courageous. And you think about what this man faces. How overwhelming would it feel to have to fill the sandals of Moses? You have this man who saw God in a burning bush. This is God's helper who leads the nation out of slavery. Moses had parted the Red Sea. His face would literally glow with the radiance of the time that he spent speaking to God. Joshua's probably looking at him going, I bet they make a movie about this guy. (laughs) But the verse 2, God says very plainly, Moses is dead, and you are in charge now. In the past, he could refer the hard stuff to Moses. You know, that's that's, that's tough. Let's go take this to Moses. And now one author said, (laughs) now the buck stops at his tent flat. It's up to Joshua. You know, how how many how many here can they, if you know who knows the seventeenth president of the United States? Who came after Lincoln? Johnson. Very good. Andrew Johnson. Who was the prime minister who followed Winston Churchill? This man, Robert Anthony Eden. So much pressure to follow in the footsteps of of a leader. And the people, the nation of Israel, they're on the verge of entering the promised land. It's just here across the river. This would be the actual view that Moses was given and the direction to the cities. And the boundaries are given there in verse 4. And in verse 6, God has reminded them, you know, I promised this land to your ancestors hundreds of years earlier. And Rochelle wrote this. This chunk of land was the single-minded focus of all these millions of people who have been traveling now for four decades. They are so close. And it's so full of hostiles. It's on the other side, if we look in chapter 3, verse 15, of a river swollen to flood stage. I think Joshua can relate very well to feeling overwhelmed. And yet there are how many other aspects of this account that say Joshua was strong. He was crazy. I hope that you will read. Keep reading the book of Joshua in the next coming oh seven weeks or so, because we we can't cover all the information on Sunday mornings. When when you first meet Joshua, he's one of the slaves in Egypt, and he experiences all that. There's speculation that if he was a firstborn, he knows exactly what it means to have the angel of death pass over and preserve your life. And he comes up out of Egypt with the nation. Moses will call on Joshua in Exodus 17 when they go into battle. He's the one who has to lead the fight. And that's where Moses, you know, when Moses' arms are raised to God, the nation, the army wins. And when Moses gets tired and drops his arm, they start to lose. So Aaron and her literally prop Moses' arms up and hold him up and God grants the victory. And Joshua learned from the first day, it is God who wins these battles. And I like the, the comment, the command that God makes to Moses. This is Exodus seventeen 14. They've just won that victory. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And I highlight that, make sure that Joshua hears it because he knows he's telling Moses, I'm going to do great things through this kid, but you are going to have to keep him encouraged. Joshua and Caleb were the only two spies. Remember, 40 years ago, Moses had sent 12 spies into the promised land, and 10 of them were discouraging. We can't do it. Only Joshua and Caleb said, we have faith. God is able. We can do exactly what he has promised. And during the then 40 years of wandering and waiting, Moses has had a tent of meeting outside the camp where he will go and meet with God, and Joshua stays there. And he guards the ten, if you will. But he's been in this situation learning from Moses for all these decades firsthand. And I wanted to kind of pause right here in this consideration because this is a turning point. Okay, Joshua 1, he's kind of um, mid-stride. He's being urged to be strong, be courageous. And he will be. He will become that 
Okay? But he's also faced some points where he's discouraged and he feels overwhelmed, as we all might just, does that make sense? You know, it's a process. It's a journey. Just like parenting, marriage, finances, um, sports and stage, you know, it, it's a process. And we succeed and we do better, and sometimes you have some setbacks and some discouragements. So I wanted to insert that idea right here because I kept reading and studying about Joshua, and the reports and the accolades just kept mounting, and he got better and better. It says One author says, as we study this book that bears his name, we'll see that Joshua was not only a soldier, but apparently a general with exceptional military skills. General Douglas MacArthur once listed Joshua among the truly great generals of world history. And preacher and author R.C. Sproul likened Joshua with Stonewall Jackson, the famous Civil War general, very known, well known for a profound commitment to God, to prayer. Um, he is a general that is quoted as saying, the battle is ours, the outcome is God's. And then another writer said, Joshua never stooped to pilfering or plunder. That was never part of his battle. And, and the list of all these admirable qualities, I think, kind of peaked then with this quote from Philip Keller. Joshua has seldom been given the full credit he deserves as perhaps the greatest man of faith ever to set foot on the stage of human history. I thought, wow, well, that's pretty high praise. Uh, in fact, his entire brilliant career was a straightforward story of simply setting down one foot after another in quiet compliance with the commands of God. And I started thinking, did this guy walk on water? No. And, I'm, and I'm not trying to be ugly, as Sean Pierce would say, not trying to be ugly. No, no Joshua was not Jesus. Namesake, yes, Yeshua. Where Jesus got his name. He's a forerunner. He's a type. He's an illustration. But he's not perfect. He had his struggles, like we do. He felt overwhelmed. If you look forward in chapter 9, uh, verse 14, 15, Joshua is going to make a very costly treaty with the Gibeonites, the locals who come and deceive him and his men, and now he's obligated to come to their aid, and it's going to be an all-night forced march for the army, and it's going to be 24 hours battle. They, they were duped because the locals, they understand that they're going to wipe out everybody close. So these guys went and found moldy bread and worn-out sandals. And they walked over and said, Oh, we've come from so far away. When we started, this bread was fresh, and our shoes were right out of the box. And, and we've come all this way. We're from far away. So if you just go ahead and make a treaty with us, we'd appreciate it. And that's one less thing you have to worry about. And Joshua and the generals ate the bread. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's bad. Okay, we'll do it. And they never consulted God. And it's not very long after that the other locals figure out there's a treaty here. So they go to attack the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites call them up and say, hey, buddy, you got to honor. And they're like, you can just see Joshua and Gibeonites. I thought they lived in Georgia. But no, they live in Granville. We're obligated. You know. and, and it was a problem. So, so I, I'm just trying to relate that Joshua is both. Okay? He comes to this point in this chapter where he feels overwhelmed. He does. But he overcomes it and he moves on to become very strong and courageous just as he's challenged. And our question for us is how, how did he do it? If Joshua was where I am now, overwhelmed, and he moved on to a better place to be strong and courageous and overcame. How do I get there? You know, how did Joshua rise to meet the challenge? And we'll just put two efforts on this last one for the outline A and B. Um, the first one is that Joshua realizes the constant presence of God. He understands God is always there. He realizes it. Uh, verse 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. The end of verse 10. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And that's a question for us. Can you sense the presence of God day to day? Do you appreciate the reality that you have God with you by your side? Talk about the greatest teammate any of us have. I don't know what's on your slate for the coming week. You probably have something scheduled. Who will be there with you? Who's going to do it with you? And I and it might pain any Cavalier fans to talk about NBA basketball at the moment, 
but their opponents, the Golden State Warriors, and specifically Kevin Durant, he's taking a little bit of heat right now, a little bit of ribbing, because he, as an all-star in and of himself, went and left that team and joined up with an already very good team, the Golden State Warriors. They, they were in the finals the last two years without him. And now he's on that team, and people kind of fuss with him, but to be honest, would I want to do that? If I could surround myself with excellent teammates, wouldn't I want to do that? If you have a work project coming up, who do you want on the committee? All the lazy people? <laughs> like, who, who do I want to work with? And Joshua is learning. When he learns to sense the presence of God, then he has confidence. And then that exudes out of him. And now all the guys, they want to be with Joshua. The military expression. When the, when the shooting starts, that's the guy I want in my foxhole. They figured that about Joshua. We're encouraged by other people's Courage. And another preacher illustrated, I could relate, you might too. He said, the pre-game sizing up. I always did this as an athlete. Your pre-game warm-ups. You're on your end of the field, and you've got one eye on what you're supposed to be doing, warming up. But my other eye's on the other end, because that's where the other team is. And I'm trying to figure out who's the strongest, who's the fastest, who's big, are they bigger, who has what. I still, I laughed at myself, because I still do it as a coach with 9- and 10-year-old girls. You know, our girls are down here just minding their own business, and I'm just standing watching the other team the whole time, trying to figure out who's going to mark who. And the toughest one we faced was, she's not here right now, so I can say, our own Emeretta Thompson. She's a terror and a beast on the soccer field. <laughs> and she's on the other team. And I knew this. <laughs> and right at the beginning of the game, I told, but the girls are on the field, and I told one girl, I said, you mark her wherever she goes. And their coach audibly sighed. Oh. I'm like, yeah, that's right, buddy, I know. You know, I've played with her before. I know exactly what we need to do. If I have a Thompson or a Travis or some of these kids, I'm more confident. That's how these soldiers felt in the foxhole with Joshua. And that's how we all need to say, with God present. Do I sense it? And we said earlier about the river, uh, Wayne, we're going to have a video here. I don't know that I told Wayne, but if you can put up that clip of the river. Somebody was there. At the actual Jordan, just a few seconds. This is what it's like at flood stage. You're the nation of Israel, and you're supposed to cross the river, and that's what you think. You get a glimpse of the sign in the middle that's written in Hebrew. Can you imagine? God says, I'll be with you. I think it'd be so much easier if the river was dry bed. You know, oh yeah, we'll go across. And you know, God will be able to do that. I don't know if you've ever caught yourself wondering about the Bible people. Have you ever kind of thought to yourself, really, they should have been more faithful? I mean, really, presence of God, they had it. Way differently from what they had it every day. Uh, how, how could Joshua not sense it? And we've put this image up before the, the giant pillar of cloud and fire that led the camp day and night. The presence of God. You're putting your little girl to bed at night. She says, Mommy, is God here? And right there. Every day, every night, manna, food, miraculously supplied. Every day, the presence of God. It should have been so obvious. And that might be why God is so warning Joshua right here in chapter 1. Because in 3, he will part the waters. They will go across that raging on dry ground. But as soon as they cross the river into the promised land, the manna stops. No more. And the speculation is the pillar of fire and cloud stopped as well. And the people are going to have to learn a different appreciation of the presence of of God. And if we're going to be strong and courageous, we have to be able to sense and appreciate God's presence. Um, as we said, God parted the river for the Israelites. Um, I feel that God guided, I've told the old timers, the more you're here, the more you hear the story. Brandon, age two, getting in our conversion van that was left running and driving it into that creek and not hitting the Skinners, the Kaisers, and various other people that were seated. on, And I, I still see these people. It's been now 21 years later thinking, where would we be if God hadn't been present in that protection? 
I see God coming down the path in Haiti in 2012. It was literally a long haul to carry those 90-pound bags of cement, and I was done. And I had a, a load, and I didn't know how I was going to get it there. And here comes the older, and Derek says, I will take yours and mine. You know? And I just watch him walk off with what I couldn't begin to carry. And I still say, here is God saying, I'll be present, and I will help. You know? is, is that true for you? And I don't know if you're, if you're like me, you start thinking, when's the, when's the easiest, if I will, the most obvious times to see God's presence? It's the tough times. It's the struggles. And R.C. Sproul said, Christian people are often called to be in dangerous, perilous adventures. He said the history of the Bible and God's people is suffering. And Jesus says this is a certainty. He says in John 16, 33, you will have pain. You will. What he promises is his presence to Joshua to us, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. And this was significant. He said, many, this R.C. Sproul, many times we feel the absence of God. And then he said this. He said, God never promised that we wouldn't feel his absence, but we would never live in his absence. That's significantly different. You won't feel his absence, but you won't live in his absence. Have you ever felt Felt something wasn't true. You know? Have you ever felt like there was somebody in the house? Get up. There's somebody in the house. I just feel it. It really wasn't, but you feel it. I feel like everybody's just watching me. You know, which I do now, but you know what I mean? It's like, you, know, it's like you're, you think everybody's watching you, but they're really not. Or uh, everybody's talking about us. Yeah, it's, it's the sense you get. And you realize later they're not. How many times if you just rely on your feelings, that's wrong. And I understand the opposite. There are times when you can sense, feel, you know, you feel like you can almost touch the presence of God. There are moments. Uh, the, the sits countdowns are starting now. I've seen them online. 17 days. Because the kids know what it is to go and spend a week where they will say, you literally feel the presence of God for a week. But it's not always quite that tangible. So I have to appreciate that God is still present even when it doesn't feel quite like sits. God knew it would be tough. He knew it would be tough for Joshua. He knew it would be tough for us. That's why there's a B to that A. He says, I won't forsake you, and you meditate on my words. You don't forsake me. That, that'll bring you the success. Constant recollection, the word of God. And as we did, we sent that email out, and I love it when God does this because we sent that email out on Monday. We were just going to do the Psalm 117, I didn't think it would connect to the sermon at all, but now it does. You know, as I went through and developed, it was like God says, here is how, verse 8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Where is Joshua going to find all this strength and courage and wisdom? In the word of God. And if you can now quote Psalm 117, I'm going to guess that you meditated on those two verses at some point for some length during the week. I did get one immediate email response as soon as I sent that out. They looked at Psalm 117 and they said, are we going to do Psalm 119 in a couple of weeks? Now, if you know, Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible, those two verses. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible pages and pages, and it has a total of 176 verses. And I sent back, well, it's your choice. Either you do this one this week or Psalm 119 next week. Take your pick. You know. Think about it. Did, did you have Psalm 117 open a little more this week than you would? Did, did you discuss it? I mean, we were talking about it Wednesday night. Music practice, we were talking about it. Out in the, around the dinner table, we talked about it. Out the car this morning we talked about. I don't know if you had note cards uh, stuck on the refrigerator. You know, Psalm, Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. 
The meditating on the Word. This, this is what Paul is talking about to the Ephesians. He writes to the Ephesians and says, Our minds need to be washed with water through the Word of God. That's Ephesians 5.26. Meditating on the Word. It's like, it's like water cleanses. It's helping wash my mind, the misguided, the false beliefs, the wrong plans, anything that might make me feel afraid or overwhelmed. It's cleansed from our mind when I can fill it with the Word of God. I don't know if anybody had the... Did you have to wash a kid or an animal this week for any reason? You know, they get so dirty. I mean, it's just... How does this happen? You know, and, and you've got to say that's what happens to our minds spiritually, sometimes unknowingly. It needs to be washed. And I know I'm right here at the end. I'm going to try to go through. You can still see. i got one, two, three, four, five at the end. John Ortberg, The Life You've Always Wanted talking about meditation, the first of those five, ask God to meet you there in the Scripture before you even begin reading. We talked about this when we had discipleship a couple weeks ago. Pray, God, speak to me. Meet me here in this text. This is Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Second principle, if I'm going to meditate on this text, repentant spirit. I read the Bible with a repentant spirit, an open spirit. Spirit, I'm not just reading for information, transformation. Show me. You've got to ask this. God, show me with the word. Do I have a shortcoming? Do I need to make a change? This is Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And God instructed Joshua the same way in our Joshua 1 text, verse 7. Be careful. Obey everything that Moses gave you. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Stay on this path. And sometimes we might have to read the Bible and say, do I need to make a course correction? Do I need to come in with what the Scripture says? And I thought about doing a blog. I don't know if I... But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that want to be prosperous, want to be successful. There's all kinds of speakers and sites and everything. The Bible tells you how to do it. In Joshua 1, 8... Follow the word of God. If you want to be prosperous, this is Psalm 1-3. Whatever he does, prospers. That's the same. If you want prosperity, it's the same argument. It's the man or the woman who focuses and dwells and meditates on the word of God, all its parts. How many people do you know that want to obey parts of the Bible? Third in the list, meditate on a fairly brief passage or narrative. Just There's so much good here in Joshua, that's why I'm asking you. you got to read the 24 chapters outside of our Sunday mornings because we don't have time to go through. all. And even in this, we have nine verses this morning, a couple paragraphs. Pick one or two that you focus on and meditate on this week. Now we're going to encourage you, keep reading the whole Bible. Read through it in a year, read through it in a period. Uh, you need that big picture. But if you're going to grow, transform Take a couple of verses, Psalm 117. I'm not able to memorize a couple of verses unless I read them and read them and reread them throughout the week. I have to focus on a smaller section. And they said, read it slowly like you would a letter from your loved one who is stationed overseas thousands of miles away. Or an email. Or sometimes even you have a phone call and then you just play it back in your mind. Every word. Just draining every encouragement you can from it. Number four. Take that verse with you. Take one verse with you throughout the day. Uh, Read it as long as you need to 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 digest it, and then take one with you. It's like if reading the Bible is like your favorite meal. Somebody sets your favorite meal in front of you. You just want to take one bite and not even chew it and swallow it and go on. No, you want to savor it and develop it. If if you battle headaches, Tylenol, aspirin, or something, most of us don't expect two seconds later. You know, it's going to take a while. Might have to lay down. Give it time to digest, sink in, be absorbed. Same thing with the truth. And one author suggested that, that we say it out loud. With what the mind repeats, it retains. It was Warren Wearsby. If you don't talk to your Bible, your Bible isn't likely to talk to you. <laughs> I like that idea, index card, something on the fridge, something I carry in my pocket all day long. And it leads to the last one. Allow the scripture to become part of your memory. That's why I thought the whole thing with Psalm 117 just naturally fit this. If Psalm 117 is now part of your memorization, you probably already followed several of these steps. 
And as I said, we're not going to, we're not going to, as a group, quote Psalm 119, but this is verse 11. It's very good. It's part of our pledges in, in the Vacation Bible School. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's a guard. It's the defense. When something comes up that tempts me, I know it's outside of, and the scripture is already in my mind, it helps protect me. How am I doing at memorizing and quoting if we did this? We obviously didn't. But if you walk out of here some Sunday and the foyer walls are covered with note paper, I said, just write what you know. Just add whatever verses you have. Let's see how we can do. This was actually performed in the 50s. Nick, Nick Rifkin wrote that book, The Insanity of God, in Russia. That's an actual picture of Russia. From, it's not from the book. I'm not uh, disclosing the identification of any Christians, but th- that's just a generic picture. In that setting, the church was thriving in house settings, homes. So the young people were benefiting and growing in church, but they spent all of their time with just family and maybe cousins. And these three preachers said, what if we could get all the kids to come together? And they invited all the Russians, there were 18 to 30, to come to a conference. And they knew the government would find out about it. And they did. And the three preachers spent three years in jail for organizing this. But they said, we'd do it again. Because of Spirit, they had 700 kids come together. And they knew. None of, none of them owned a Bible. They didn't have hymnals. They, they didn't have lyrics, lead sheets. They said, I wonder how much truth we have. So the groups would come together and they said, when you go meet in a small group, you take paper and you just construct as much of the four Gospels as your group can put together and as many songs and hymns as you can recollect. And when the conference was over, those kids had the entirety of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with less than six errors. Songs, hymns, and choruses, they had 1,200 that they had committed to memory and shared together. How will we do? You know? and, and Ripken wrote this. He said, It became clear to me in an instant why and how the Christian faith had survived and often thrived under decades of communist oppression in the Soviet Union. He said, I understood what enabled so many Russians to remain strong and faithful believers. They understood the presence of God, and they internalized his word. It made them strong and courageous. It enabled Joshua to be strong and courageous and overcome. It will be true for us as well. Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to live in a country that is so free, where access is so readily available to the truth that has endured. And yet sometimes that just means we take it for granted. And we don't uh, make the effort or invest the time like we could or should. Father, we are often willing to say that we feel overwhelmed, that we feel like there's so much coming at us, towards us, that we don't know how we can possibly get it all done, and yet we know that the Reality is that our strength comes from you. That we need to understand and appreciate anew your presence every day and the truth that we find in your word. May it be a part of not only our minds, but our hearts and our lives and our mouth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And we always encourage you, challenge you. Maybe you know that you need to make a stand. Again, to this day in this country, at this point, There are not authorities outside the doors that are going to arrest you and jail you for this decision. But it is an internally significant choice that you make. Let's stand together. Uh, We'll sing our invitation.
much appreciate all the folks that made an uh, effort to be a part. The last six weeks, we all had Sunday school together. That ended last week. Today, you go back to your class as normal, if you will. I uh, appreciate all the efforts everybody made to rearrange the building and put all that back. So we're ready to start a new quarter this morning for Sunday school. And you might see the big box and the four boxes in the foyer. The big central cardboard box, if you have toiletries, hygiene, things to help share with the homeless, Effie and her ministry, they have, I think, she said like 25 folks, they go out every day, they know where the homeless are in the villages and the cities in our county, they provide what they need if they can help, so we're collecting in that big box for June. The four little boxes or little containers need to be, if you can take them, they've got a sticker in it, whether it goes to the Hawks Nest or the library or I forget where, a coffee shop, places in Alexander. If you would be willing, if you want to take one or more of those, I haven't asked them yet, so if they decline, politely say thank you and bring it back. But if they're willing, that little box, and then we'll need to kind of check those through the month. You know, if you're willing to say, yeah, I just stop in town and see if anything's overflowing, come dump it in the box. So if you want to take one or more of those four, feel free. I don't have anything else. Jeff, anything you have or prayer for this morning? Everything's normal. Okay. Father, we thank you for this time that we can be together this morning, and uh, just we thank you so much that we can come together as brothers and sisters and um, just learn a little bit more about you and learn a little bit more of you know, what it means to really lean on you and know that you will never you will never abandon us, you will never forsake us, that you will always be with us, no matter where we are or who we're speaking with or any situation, Father, that you are always present and you are always there. And you are always choosing love first. Father, we thank you for this time again. And as we go from here, I ask you to give us safety. Uh, and also just continue to give us encouragement as, as we just try to you know, figure out what it means to make disciples, Father. We love you and it's all that we ask and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's close this morning by singing, I'll fly away. <coughs>